<clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much, Pach. Uh, I uh, agree, this is uh, quite a lineup that's been set for today. Uh, a very, very exciting day full of action-packed stuff. So I'm supposed to open the show. I've got to talk about exciting stuff as well. So okay, in that spirit, you're going to learn a lot of exciting stuff today. Let's kick it off with some exciting stuff. Let's talk about economics. <laughs> Let's talk about capitalism. So um, there are competing theories of economies and how to run an economy, capitalism being one of them. Uh, and the theory with capitalism is that if you have uh, an open market, that competition, healthy competition, uh, kind of keeps things in check, uh, a sort of self-regulating economy through this uh, invisible hand, right? Uh, and the idea is that if you have that, if you have this, this, this healthy marketplace, you end up with a distribution of, of wealth that's somewhat like a bell curve. Bell curve distributions show up a lot, right, in like school tests or... Uh, you know, IQ or height or weight or age, right? It's generally a bell curve distribution, which means, yes, yeah, some people have more than others, some people have less, but it all more or less kind of evens out. Um, so the theory with, with, with capitalism is you, some people will have more wealth than others, but it's fairly evenly distributed because of this, this healthy competition that the, the market self-regulates. But what tends to happen... Uh, when you leave it to self-regulation is you get a distribution more like this, a power law distribution, uh, where you've got like the 1%, right? Having a whole lot more wealth and then a long tail of poverty. Um, uh, so bell curve distribution would be great. What we end up with is power law distribution. Like I said, it's because what, what, we, what gets lost is the healthy competition, the healthy marketplace, uh, um, the kind of self-regulating part. Um, so, so capitalism, it sounds great in theory, but it doesn't really work in practice. Uh, and personally, I actually believe the theory is, the theory is pretty good, because uh, competition, I, I think, is good. I think a, a healthy marketplace of competition is good, and the alternative where you get a monopoly, duopoly, right, where you get power concentrated in a small number of players, uh, where you get companies that are too big to fail, um, is not good. Right? That, that, that this kind of distribution of, of power doesn't work out that well. And I, I say that because we've all been here. We've seen this play out in our own industry uh, when the browser wars happened. When, when Internet Explorer ended up with uh, an absolute monopoly of browser share, you know, over 90%, uh, very much in that you know, power law distribution shooting off up to the right. And, and that happened because uh, they had an existing monopoly um, in the desktop operating system uh, world, right? And then they were able to bundle their web browser with their operating system, which itself enjoyed over 90% market share. So this is the problem when capitalism goes from being this bell curve distribution to power law distribution, is that the, the people in that, in that narrow margin, they can do all, basically whatever they want. And there's no accountability, there's no, no regulation. Um, now, we managed to dodge a bullet here, right? We managed to pull it back from the brink. I mean, Firefox was a direct result, um, direct answer to this, this situation. Um, and I'm, I, since then, I, I've, I'm very much of the belief that the more web browsers, the better. Uh, I know sometimes web developers like think, ah, oh, life would be so much easier if we just had, like, one web browser to develop for us. Like, no, no, we've been there. It was not a good scene, right? Um, it, you know... It was comfortable in a way. You only had one browser to code for, right? IE6, that was it. And the, even Microsoft stopped developing browsers. They're like, that's it. There's only one web browser. Um, but it was not good for the web. And then, you know, it wasn't good for us. So be careful what you wish for, right? Next time you're thinking, ah, oh, there's all these different browsers. I wish there was just one browser. It's like, no, no, no. That's, just be careful what you wish for. But we dodged a bullet here, right? We managed, to, we managed to pull it back, and we have a, a fairly healthy amount of competition in the browser market today. I wish there were more, like I said. The more browsers, the better. So I kind of feel like the web in, interpreted this monopoly as damage and, and rooted around it. Uh, there, was a, there was a bit of an invisible hand happening there. Um, and this idea of um, interpreting something as damage and rooting around it, that, well, that's the term that comes from, from networks, right? This idea that a network can can root around damage. And like economics, there's varying competing theories 
of how to build a network, how to construct a network, just like there's competing theories on how to build an economy. Um, so one of the models you could choose if you're building a network is this uh, hub and spoke model. Um, so not all nodes on the network are equal, right? You've got these kind of uh, smaller nodes on the outside all connecting to a central hub, and then the central hubs can connect to one another. So this would have been how the telegraph system worked, uh, and then that was picked up by the phone system, right? We literally had the operators doing the switching. Um, this is still the way that uh, airports work, right, globally. So you have lots of regional uh, airports that connect to the central hubs, and then the central hubs connect to one another. Uh, and it works. it works. It works really well until you lose the central hub, right? So you, what you've got is a single point of failure, and if that central hub gets knocked out, those, those regional nodes are stranded. There's no way to communicate. So you've got a single uh, point of failure in, in the form of this um, sort of monopolistic node on the network. And of course, that vulnerability was the, the impetus behind the, the ARPANET, right, which is sort of the precursor to the Internet. The city of, if you've got a communications network like this, which is exactly what the phone system was, then you are vulnerable to attack. Right? Uh, uh, an enemy power just needs to knock out your hub, and now your nodes are stranded. Right? So an alternative approach is to distribute the connections. This is a distributed network. And this is much more like a, a bell curve distribution, in that some nodes do have more connections than others, but not by much. Some have a few more, some have a few less, but it evens out. You know, most of the nodes are relatively even. So even if you were to knock out a relatively well-connected node, the other nodes can still communicate. Not as efficiently as they could before, but they can still route signals around. And this is the genius of packet switching, right? That it's like, just get a signal from one node to another using whatever path you want. And this, this uh, idea of packet switching, which was at the heart of the ARPANET and then led to the internet, that came out as a direct result of the problem of a, a, a centralized communication network. You probably heard, oh yeah, the internet was built to withstand the nuclear attack. It's not, it's not as simple as that. But the initial impetus for this sort of distributed network did come from the fear of having a centralized communication hub. It did come from command and control. I think some people you know, sometimes use that to say, like, oh, there's, there's blood on the hands of the Internet because it came out of this kind of, you know, warlike idea that it was about having uh, a step up on the enemy. But actually, no, if you, if you go back and read what um, Paul Baran and, and the other people at ARPANET were talking about, it was the exact opposite. Because here's the thing. If you have a communication network with that hub-and-spoke model and you've got that single sort of hub and that could be taken out and your whole communication network goes down, then... In case of possible conflict, you're more likely to launch a first strike because you know if the enemy gets in there and gets your hub, you're screwed. If, however, you've got a distributed network and you know you could actually withstand an attack and, and then decide what to do, in the case of that you know, first decision, you're less likely to launch a first strike, provided that both sides have this distributed network. So Paul Baran and the other people who came up with this, this sort of model we're in favor of sharing this technology with the Russians, even though this was like the height of the Cold War. So it wasn't built to get an upper hand in, in case of nuclear war. It was actually built to reduce the possibility of nuclear war even happening. So, so this network architecture, this distributed architecture, was then inherited by the Internet, which was sort of the successor to the ARPANET. Uh, and it's, it's kind of like the opposite of the hub and spoke, which has the idea of, you know, central uh, powerful nodes is that like, anybody can join, right? You can just keep adding to the network. It's scale-free. It doesn't matter how big or how small the overall network is. You can just keep adding nodes, and all the nodes are more or less equal. And then that same architecture, again, is pretty much uh, what we use on the web. You don't need to apply to add a new website to the web. You just make a new website, right? You, you don't need permission to link uh, to another node on the network. You just link. And so, again, it's the scale-free network. The, the web could be small. The web could be big. It doesn't have a planned architecture. So more, every URL, as far as the web is concerned, is, is equal. Of course, some URLs are more popular than other URLs. But in theory, in the network layer, every URL is equal. So it's a mess. It's a beautiful mess. 
but it's wild and sprawling and, and chaotic. That's kind of what makes it so great, this, this wild, sprawling, chaotic World Wide Web. But in the early days of the web, there was competition. Um, these kind of much more uh, constrained, curated places, safer places. As you had uh, CompuServe, AOL, I don't mean AOL the website now, before it was a website, AOL was literally like an alternative to the web. Um, you had its own web browser. Does anybody remember the AOL web browser? Uh, yeah, us old people, yeah. Um, yeah, in fact, that's, it's, it's kind of like, I kind of th that there's maybe a, a, an analogy to be drawn with native apps as well. Like these, these things were slicker and, and, and better, you know, in, in many ways, but they couldn't compete with the, the sprawling mess of, of the World Wide Web, right? So CompuServe, AOL, these, these sort of walled gardens, they're producing the content for you, saying, no, no, stay here, read these articles, here's this wonderful stuff we're making for you, you know, Beware when you go out into the wild, lawless World Wide Web and stay within the, the gated community of, of, of AOL or CompuServe. But they couldn't compete. They couldn't compete with the wild, lawless World Wide Web and all the, the, the wonderful stuff being produced there. So the web absolutely won over uh, these walled gardens. And yet fast forward a few years, and everyone's back inside some walled gardens. Facebook, Twitter, Medium, right? Um, and here's the crazy thing. AOL and CompuServe had loads of staff trying to produce really you know, good content that would keep people within the walled gardens so that people wouldn't you know, go out to the World Wide Web. And um, Facebook and Twitter, I mean, they don't even produce the content. We do. They're the biggest media companies in the world, and they don't produce any media. We make the media for them. But then they get to decide what happens with it. Who sees it? They get to control the hyperlinks. Now, how did this happen? <laughs> how do we go back into the walled gardens that aren't even, frankly, as good as the ones we had before because we have to make our own entertainment within them? Um, and I remember when I first came across Facebook because you know, I was on all these different social networks. And all of them kind of had something in common, which was this idea of the social object, that the, the network was built around a thing. <laughs> So Flickr was a social network based around photographs. The photograph was a social object. There was a upcoming.org was events, right? And Doppler was about travel. So you had, you had a reason, and then the, the network was built around that. And someone's telling me about Facebook and saying, you should get on Facebook. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, what's it for, right? So, like, you know, expecting an answer, like, in the same way Flickr is for photographs or upcoming is for events. So I said, what's it for? And, and the person telling me about it said, everyone is on it. And I was like, yeah, no, no, but what's it for? And he's like, everyone is on it. And now I realize that's exactly the reason. That is what Facebook is for. Everyone is on Facebook because everyone is on Facebook, right? And this is the classic example of, of Metcalfe's law, that the, the power of a network is proportional to the square of the number of views, something like that, right? That basically the more people on your network, it doesn't get just um, linearly better, like the network is exponential, you get, you get a, a power law distribution that, that with every extra uh, user of that network. It's like whoever had the first fax machine basically had a lump. It, it was useless. But as soon as there was one more fax machine, it was exponentially more useful. It's kind of like that. So everyone is on Facebook because everyone is on Facebook, uh, which is powerful. To absolutely making use of Metcalfe's law, you get the, that power law distribution. Um, that's great, but this also suffers from the hub and spoke problem is that you now have a single point of failure. So for example, if this is where everyone is, is producing and consuming media, uh, if, if, you, if you want to attack media, you, instead of having to take out like hundreds of media outlets, you can just go for the hub. So let's say, oh, I don't know, let's say you're uh, Russian propagandists and you want to attack Western democracy. You don't have to take out hundreds of different outlets. You just need to target the hubs, Facebook, Twitter. Jobs are good on right? It's, it's, it's a, I guess in the security world, they talk about large attack vectors, right? This is, it's a large attack vector. It's like, um, you know, uh, you need, if you have a WordPress install, you really need to keep it patched because there's all sorts of uh, attacks made on WordPress. It's not that WordPress is uh, any, any more vulnerable than other CMSs. It's just it's really popular, and that makes it a large attack vector. And same with, with something like Facebook or Twitter. It's very popular, which gives you all these benefits, gives you Metcalfe's law, 
right? It's exponentially more powerful than a smaller network, um, but it's a large attack vector, um, which is a shame. So you, you suffer from the hub and spoke model. So, but why is everybody on Facebook? Why is everybody on Twitter? It's actually not that hard a question to answer. It's convenient. The friction is really low. If you want to publish something on the web, it's so much more easier to you know, shoot something off on Facebook or Twitter or Medium than to you know, get your own domain and make your own website. And you know, you've got to deal with you know, keeping that, that WordPress installed patched right? and, and all that stuff. So you get a whole lot of convenience by staying within a, a walled garden. Um, the downside is you, get, you, you lose the control. The control you would have if, if you were in charge of the hyperlinks, you've ceded that control now to, to the walled garden, to Facebook, to Twitter, to whatever it might be. Um, so, so this is the fundamental problem, is you've got the hassle and the friction of publishing your own content compared to the convenience of letting someone else take care of that. Um, but what you give up is control. You cede control to those same people. They control the hyperlinks. They decide who sees what. Right? So that's where the indie web comes in, is to try and bridge this gap. It's not that you know, uh, we think everybody should be installing their own operating systems and running their own computers in their kitchens. But you can do that if you want. But just somehow have both the convenience and the control at the same time, um, which is a challenge. That's a real challenge. How can we get control of publishing on our own sites, control of owning our own data, without sacrificing the convenience of, of the walled gardens? So the basic idea of the, this indie web sort of movement, here's a shocker, is that uh, you should have a website. Right? Time was that would not have been an uncontroversial uh, idea, but these days it's, it's, it's downright disruptive. Um, now, personally, I, I have another reason why I, I want to have control and publish from my own website, and that's the, the longevity of what I publish. I've uh, been around long enough now that trust no one is my mantra when it comes to giving someone else uh, content, right? giving someone else your, your writings, your, your thoughts, your dreams, your hopes. Um, if you ever published and blogged on MySpace, sorry, it's gone, right? Um, and MySpace was the Facebook of its day. It was impossible to imagine a web without MySpace, just as it's impossible to imagine a web without Facebook. But anything you publish there is gone. Same with GeoCities, Delicious, Magnolia, Pounce, Doppler. I could go on, right? I've been there, man. Now, I'm not saying that everything should be online forever. Far from it. What I'm saying is that the decision about when something disappears should be in the hands of the person who put that thing online. It should be your decision how long something is online. I want things to be online for a long time. That's my decision. You might want things to be online for a short time. It's your decision. Point is, you should have that decision-making control. Um, longevity on the web is a, is a big problem anyway. Right? Link rot is, is, is a really big issue with the web. The average lifespan of a web page is 100 days. Um, it's kind of built into the architecture of the web in a way. Um, when Tim Berners-Lee and, and Robert Caillou first had this World Wide Web project, they submitted a paper to a, a hypertext conference saying, yeah, we want to talk about this World Wide Web project we've built. And uh, the paper was rejected. Said, no, it's stupid what you're proposing. Because for one thing, there was no concept of two-way links on the web. Every other theoretical hypertext system had this idea of two-way links that you know, you're, you're connecting a node over there, but also that node has knowledge of the connection. Um, so that then if, if, if the linked resource were to move, the, the connection could be maintained there was, because there's that two-way linking, which is a, you know, great in theory, not so good in practice, uh, much like capitalism, because um, it is so much more complex to implement. Whereas the web has a ridiculously simple model, which is you just link to something. It's a one-way link. That's it. You don't need to set anything special up. You don't need to ask for permission. You just link to something. But then if that linked resource were to move, oh, well, tough luck, 404. Right? You, got, you got bit rot. So it's kind of the price we pay um, for the, the simplicity and ease of the web is that link rot seems to be built into the web. But um, there's, a, there's kind of a technique that if you, if you squint at it just right, it sort of seems like two-way linking on the web. Um, Ish. And it's down to a, a very humble bit of HTML 
the rel attribute, which you're all probably familiar with from you know, the link element. Uh, rel is short for relationship. And the attribute says the relationship of the linked document, so whatever's in the href attribute, is whatever the value of rel is. So you've probably all done this, where you link off to a style sheet. You, you put the URL in the href, and you say link rel equals style sheet. This, the linked document, the CSS file, has the relationship of being a style sheet for the current document. And uh, it doesn't just uh, happen on a link element. You can use it on A elements as well. Not many people do, but just so you know, it's a valid attribute. So you can say things like, oh, the link document, what's in the href, is, is the previous document to this one. Right? It has that relationship. Or it's the next document. So these are very useful in like search results pages. You can say rel equals pre, rel equals next. So there's a whole bunch of these values you can, you can throw in there. And, and there's one that on the face of it sounds um, really silly, actually. Rel equals me. And the linked document has a relationship of being me. Right? It doesn't, doesn't seem to make sense at first. But um, I use it. I use it on my own website. And here's how I'd use it. I'd link off to another URL that also represents me on the web. That isn't my own website. So here I'm looking to the Twitter uh, profile that I have control over and saying, that's me over there on Twitter. And that's me on Flickr. That's me on GitHub. Um, OK, fine. But these are still just regular one-way links. I'm just pointing out to something, saying, here's, a, here's a, a hyperlink. It's got a rel attribute. So what? Well, the interesting thing is if you go to all of those URLs, my profile on Twitter, my profile on Flickr, my profile on GitHub, uh, all of those sites allow you to, in, in your info, specify your web page. And so on Twitter, if you were to view source on the link back to my web page, you would see that they also use rel equals me. So they're saying that website there, dactio.com, my website, has a relationship of being another representation of this Twitter account. And so now you've got both of them claiming control, right? saying this, these are uh, the same person, and they're, it's verified now. Right? There's a kind of a two-way um, verification happening there. There's a two-way claim. I claim to have control over that Twitter profile. That Twitter profile claims the same person has control over my site. But what can you do with that? Well, each of those services, Twitter, GitHub, Flickr, and many more, uh, they all offer authentication. Uh, part of their API layer is that you authenticate against it using OAuth. Now, I do not want to become an OAuth provider. I, I'm just not smart enough to set that up. Um, but thanks to the mutual rel equals me links, I don't have to. I can piggyback on the fact that Twitter, GitHub, Flickr, they've already built that authentication layer. Uh, and I can make use of that using this rel me authentication. So you can set up a service like this one called uh, IndieAuth, um, where you, you literally sign in with, uh, with your own website. Let me get that. Sorry. Okay. There we go. There we go. So I can uh, put in my, my web address. Now I'll get, uh, it'll, it'll look through my page, find those rel me links, check that there's reciprocal ones. I'll choose which provider today I feel like logging in with Twitter. Now I have to make, you know, I have to be logged in and do the authentication dance. And now I'm back. I have authenticated as my own website, right? Don't need to have an account. I just need to have my own website. So I've logged in using my own website, and all I had to do was add an attribute to some hyperlinks, rel equals me. But why would I want to authenticate with something? What does that give me? OK, so authentication is one part of having an API. Um, Another part is, is having a, something people can write to. So there's this standard called Micropub. It's, I think it's candidate recommendation now at W3C. Um, and it's an endpoint that you can have on your website. So this is, much, this is more complicated than simply adding rel equals me. Now you've got to build an endpoint on your website. But it's a server-side thing, so you can build it in whatever language you're comfortable with, right? Node or PHP or, or whatever you want. And it accepts post requests. Um, you don't have to build the authentication part, though, right? You just have to build this endpoint. So once you've done that, you can uh, log in to services using your own website. Oh, it's doing this thing again. Let me try this. So yeah, I'm doing the sign in again, doing the authentication, and now I'm logged into somebody else's posting interface, right? So I can post from somebody else's interface into my website. 
Um, I did have to build a micropub endpoint, but I didn't have to take care of the authentication. So now I can, I can use other people's posting interfaces, as long as they have the micropub support, to post to my own site. This was an example of uh, one called uh, Quill. It was built by Aaron Parecki. Uh, and it's really nice, because uh, you can, if you want to do more longer form content, he's built an interface that's just like Medium, because that's a lot, the reason why a lot of people use Medium is they say, oh, it's such a lovely writing experience. So he's basically built that experience, but you can post to a micropub endpoint. And he's built these other services too called Own Your Gram and Own Your Swarm um, that allow you to use Instagram to post to your own website or use uh, Swarm to post to your own website. Um, so I authenticate with Own Your Gram or, or Own Your Swarm using uh, rel me auth, right? I do that, that, that flow and that's it. And then from then on, if I post something to Swarm, then that service is sort of listening for that and, and also sends it to my micropub endpoint. So now uh, that's gone to my website as well. So I, I used Swarm as an interface for posting to my own site. Or I post something on Instagram and then that also gets sent to my own website, right? So I'm, I'm now piggybacking on all the, all the hard work of all those engineers and, and designers that have built Swarm and built Instagram to post to my own website. So there's an acronym for this. PESOS, posting elsewhere, syndicating to your own site, okay? <laughs> um, which, is, which is fine, and that's good, and, and that's an option, but there's a better uh, alternative, which is also an acronym, and that's POSSE. You publish on your own site and syndicate elsewhere. Now, this, this option sometimes just isn't available. In the case of Instagram, uh, there is no way to post something to Instagram other than through the app. They have an API, but there's a very important API method missing, which is the ability to actually post a photograph. You must post through Instagram. So in the case of Instagram, you can only do the uh, pesos, but in lots of other services, you could do the, the posse, right? You can syndicate to Medium, you can syndicate to Facebook, you can syndicate to Twitter and to Flickr and, and many, many more. So by doing that, what you do is you benefit from the, the reach, right? When some people talk about why they publish on, on Medium, why they publish elsewhere, it's like, oh, uh, reach. They've got reach. Well, now you've got the reach, right? Because you're, you're giving them copies. The canonical version is still on your site, but you're giving copies uh, to these other services, kind of like you'd publish an RSS feed, right? Um, so on my site, I've got my own posting interface, and you can see I've, got, I've set up little sort of UI toggles. It's like, may I feel like posting this to Twitter? I feel like posting this to Flickr or wherever. Uh, it's my decision. Um, so this is a section of my site called Notes, where it's just short little updates of, hmm, say, 140 characters. Um, and I publish on my own website. So here I've, I've put up a photograph of Huxley, the awesome dog, came into the office. And that appears on my website, and it also gets syndicated out to Flickr, because I had that option done. And it gets syndicated out to Facebook. I'm kind of cheating with the Facebook syndication. It's, it's simply an if this, then that recipe. It just looks at my site, and every time I post something, throw it on Facebook, right? Um, or Twitter, right? I'm posting to Twitter, so it goes from my site to, to all of these sort of endpoints. I got the reach, right? Aha, you say. But what about when over on one of these endpoints, somebody responds, somebody leaves a comment, or they like it, or they retweet it. Uh, well, I get those on my website too. I get all of those, those sent back to me. And that's thanks to another building block called Web Mention, which is actually much simpler than, than Micropub. Again, it's, it's an endpoint, and it accepts uh, post requests, but it's, it's a super simple request. It's just this URL over here, claims to be linking to a URL on your website. That's it. It's basically a ping. It's like, I'm pinging your website. Um, so you link uh, to URL on my site, great, but I don't know about this link, right? Because that's the way the web is designed, one-way links. Uh, but then I get, a, I get a ping, and now I know, oh, okay, and I can investigate, and I can say, is it really linking to something on my site? What do I want to do with that, right? So you can ping my web mention endpoint, and I can verify that link. And then it's up to me what I do with that information. Do I publish it as a comment? Do I, do I mention it somehow? It's up to me. Um, and you don't actually even have to host your own web mention endpoint. There's a service called webmention.io. Uh, it's kind of like a, a, an answering center for, for your pings, right? You can sort of check in and say, you know, any pings for me today? Uh, kind of like a, you know, an old school telephone operator, I guess, right? An answering service. 
And there's a really uh, a great service called Bridgie, which acts as a translation service. So I pointed out that you know, somebody leaves a comment on Twitter or, or Flickr or something, and I receive that on my site. Twitter is not sending web mention pings to my site. That is not something that, that Twitter provides by default. But this Bridgie service will do that for you. So you authenticate with Bridgie using exactly the same flow, using the, as long as you have the rel equals me links on your website, you're good to go. And then it monitors the activity on Twitter, and Flickr, and a bunch of other places um, it lists there. And then translates a, a response on Twitter or a like or a retweet into a, into a ping, a web mention ping. Um, so, and then I get to decide what I do with that, and it pings my endpoint. So in this case, you know, people respond, I get these... I get those pings sent to my site, and I'm, I'm displaying them in a fairly dull, boring way, just like you know, comments, and there's a share, and the likes. It it's, it's, doesn't look great, but you can do whatever you like. Um, this is from the website of Drew McClellan. He's got this kind of face pile of all the people who've retweeted or reposted, and then he displays actual comments slightly differently. Completely up to you what you do with it. Um, Drew, uh, along with Rachel, is going to be speaking later. Uh, one of the people behind the Perch CMS, um, which has a whole bunch of these technologies now built in, um, and many CMSs do. So if you, if you are interested in having a web mention endpoint and a micropub endpoint, you don't necessarily have to build it from scratch. Somebody has probably already done it for you if you're using a CMS like Perch or Jekyll or WordPress or Kirby. Some, somebody's probably done the work for you. So you don't have to make everything from scratch. Um, so with a few building blocks, right, rel equals me, micropub, web mentions, you get to have that control of your own data, but you get to take advantage of the, the convenience, right? You get to take advantage of the fact that everyone's on Facebook or everyone's on Twitter. Um, you get to benefit from Metcalfe's law, right? Um, balancing that control with that convenience. But I just want to end by saying that these, these technologies I've shown... Rel equals me, micropub, web mentions. They're actually not the real building blocks of, of the web or the indie web. Um, you can find the real building blocks when you go to this URL, which is the design principles of, of the indie web. And, and then they're very clear to say, like, don't focus on the technologies. It's not actually the technologies that matter. You know, we can switch up our technologies. Uh, you know, focus on, on, on the experience and, and make tools for yourself first, right? And then see about helping others take advantage of that. Like I said, all these people have built plugins for these CMSs, right? They were scratching their own itch. Um, but I think that the, the most important design principle on the list is, is the final one, which is uh, to have fun. Uh, and the emoji is part of the design principle. Um, that the web can still be this wild and wonderful place, right? Yeah, lawless and chaotic, but, but fun. Um, and one of the reasons for having your own website, you know, I mentioned some earlier, the longevity, having control over your data, sure, but uh, just having a playground, having somewhere where you can try stuff out. So today you're going to hear about all these great technologies, and you might be, like, itching to try them out. And, and you can, there's places to try stuff out, right? CodePen, GitHub, all this stuff. But how about your own website? You know, scratch your own itch there. It, I've used it as a place to try out the latest CSS, the latest JavaScript. Right. Ooh, Grid sounds exciting. I'm going to play with Grid on my website. Web Audio API, I'm going to mess around with that. Right? Service workers, I'm going to add a service worker to my website. And bear in mind the original motto of the World Wide Web that Tim Berners-Lee and Robo Caillou came up with together, uh, that kind of born out of the environment at CERN. The motto of the World Wide Web was, let's share what we know. And I encourage you to do that. And you could share what you know on Mark Zuckerberg's website, or you could share what you know on Ev Williams's website, or you could share what you know on Biz Stone's website, or you could share what you know on your own website, and I hope you will. Thank you.